Nice to see you, Dr. Chang. Professor Chang is director of the Center for Personal Dynamic Regulums and the Virginia and D.K. Ludwig Professor of Cancer Research at Stanford. Uh, also an HHMI investigator, professor of dermatology and genetics um, at the School of Medicine. Um, so how do you go from dermatology to um, what you're doing now? <laughs> Yeah, dermatology is really a, an entire field that has all kinds of diseases, including cancer, autoimmune disease, many other kinds of problems. So it's actually a great field to kind of keep an open mind and think about all the different potential applications. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, to you now and i um, really interested in what you've got to tell us. Great. Well, thank you, Casper, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen to make sure that works. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so what I thought I'd do today is kind of share a little bit of our journey uh, of how we started working on uh, trying to understand the, the regulate, gene regulation landscape, what we call the regulum, and have led us ultimately to study cancer and specific kind of problem in cancer called extrachromosomal DNA. Uh, my lab has been fascinated by the non-coding genome for, for a, a long time. When we think about the genome, we often think about genes, maybe disease-associated genes. But this cartoon helps me, uh, tells me to remind you that each gene is connected to a series of regulatory elements, really switches that decide when and where genes turn on and off. And these regulatory elements are really the, the binding sites of transacting factors like transcription factor proteins, regulatory RNAs that together make these decisions. The picture in the human genome actually looks like this, just 2% is protein coding. The other 98% is really dedicated uh, to this non-coding space. Uh, we also know that actually the vast majority inherited human genetic variants associated with disease map uh, to the non-coding uh, genome. Um, so one approach that we uh, really like and pioneered uh, really takes the idea of the concept of DNA accessibility. Uh, in every human cell, two meters of DNA is packed into a 10 micron nucleus. Therefore, most of your DNA is highly compacted, not accessible, except for the active elements that are being read by the cell's machinery. Therefore, simply finding the accessible bits of DNA tells you really about the software program the cell's currently running. So several years ago, my colleague Will Greenleaf and I at Stanford developed this method called ATAC-seq, or assay of transposic accessible chromatin. And this makes use of an enzyme called transposase that copies and pastes DNA. We load up this enzyme with DNA adapters that go to your sequencing machine. So when we expose this prokaryotic enzyme to eukaryotic chromatin, it can only copy and paste into the open chromatin bits, but not into the closed elements. So in a single step, you selectively and covalently tag the regions of interest that allows you to basically then amplify and sequence these areas. So this methodology led to uh, ultimately a million fold improvement in the sensitivity and a hundred fold improvement in the speed of mapping regulatory elements in a genome wise scale. So let me show you what this kind of data would look like. So here we're looking at genomic tracks on the X axis. These are the locations of genes. On the Y axis, each peak, the height indicates a level of accessibility. So the first row is the prior gold standard, DNA's hypersensitivity, it needed 10 million cells. The first version of ATAC-seq used 50,000 cells, and ultimately single cell ATAC-seq, uh, basically you can see that these patterns look virtually identical. Uh, but now when you zoom in, this is the summation of several hundred single cells. Now, when you zoom in, every row is a single cell. There are 254 single cells here. Then at every position, you have either zero, one or two reads because this is a diploid genome. Okay, so in this way, this kind of analog signal has turned to digital data. Armed with this very powerful way of mapping uh, the, the regulatory landscape, uh, we then turn to think about other kinds of maps that might be useful, and we're inspired by the electronic maps that we all perhaps use in our daily navigate uh, our daily lives. Uh, so these electronic maps represent the real world in multiple layers, for example, basically information about land usage, elevation, different businesses, the streets, and, and maybe your friends or customers. And then each of these layers makes the map more and more useful. And by analogy, we think that if we have a snapshot of gene regulation, 
a personal regulome, we can then infer, extract from this kind of map information about cell types, cell states, tissue microenvironment, lineage, uh, drug response, connect them together with advanced computation. And indeed, so, so, so many studies over the last uh, several years really show that this is now possible. We really, really like to really directly learn uh, from patients. And so I want to show you kind of some of the, the, the fruits of that kind of effort, uh, really principally in the space of cancer. And uh, Ryan Corses uh, uh, led this at work when he was postdoc in my lab, now a faculty member at the Glassstone and UCSF. And so we uh, went and used uh, this methodology, a taxi, to look at the chromatin landscape in primary human cancers. This is using a collection called the Tumor uh, Genome Atlas, TCGA, uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which at the time uh, had many kinds uh, of information. Really, it was, this is a flagship project. Uh, that's been building for many years. By the time they had whole genome sequencing, RNA information, other mutation data, but they didn't have any chromatin information. Um, we were able to use this very sensitive method because by the time, by the time we got to it, they, are, they really had depleted almost all the samples. And so we were able to map the landscape of uh, chromatin axis, really the, the landscape of regulatory DNA in 23 human cancer types. They're illustrated here on the left. You can see that they span from glioblastoma to lung cancer, uh, uh, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, and so forth, really some of the most uh, common also aggressive cancers. Uh, we map 410 tumors, identify more than a half a million active DNA regulatory elements across uh, these cancer types. Uh, the important thing to know is that actually nearly half of these elements were not seen in other maps of normal tissues, for example, an ENCODE or um, other kinds of uh, uh, epigenomic roadmap, they're only exercised during the pathology of cancer. And these kinds of maps taught us a lot about the landscape and, and, and also the, uh, the, the biochemical causes of both inherited and somatic variations that contribute to cancer. For example, for many years, geneticists have been mapping families, taking care of families that may have elevated risk of certain kinds of cancers. And most of these risk elements map again to the non-coding genome. So there's no necessary explanation for how they may work. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you some, again, primary data, where on the x-axis, these are genomic location, the y-axis, these are accessibility. And we're looking at the MIC oncogene locus right at the bottom here, right in the center. So all these cancers basically activate MIC, but on the top five samples, color in orange, these are colon cancers. You can see that they principally uh, these cancers principally use regulatory elements to the five prime end to the left of the MIC locus, whereas in kidney cancer, shown on the bottom five in purple, uh, these cancers use uh, elements to the right hand side of MIC uh, uh, on the three prime end. Okay, so the same oncogene, different oncogene switches. The second point is that, in fact, uh, these risk uh, SNPs, uh, variants, for cancer, they map to cancer-specific enhancers. So for example, this colon cancer risk actually is maps to a colon cancer-specific enhancer here, and a kidney cancer-specific enhancer maps to, um, again, a kidney cancer enhancer in the middle of this PVT1 locus, uh, link RNA gene. And so uh, by this way, we can actually uh, provide really a biochemical explanation uh, for a lot of genetic association uh, with cancer. Now, I want to spend some time talking about this locus, PVT1, because long non-coding RNA genes, there's really, there's really one of the major focus uh, uh, in my lab. And this particular gene, PVT1, uh, was actually perhaps the first long non-coding RNA gene nominated by Cancer Genetics back in the 80s. Uh, this location, PVT1, is actually a breakpoint uh, translocation in Burkitt's lymphoma. It led to the cloning of MYC and recognition of MYC as an oncogene. So that's how far uh, back it goes in the history. Um, and um, uh, interestingly enough, there are a lot of frequent mutations and deletions within this locus. And of course, MYC is a very powerful oncogene. It's overexpressed in over half of human cancers. And it can really drive, it's a transcription factor that can really drive all the hallmarks uh, of cancer. Um, and so um, we, uh, through a series of experiments, we were able to understand that really this PVT1 gene, even though it's basically transcribing a long non-coding RNA, its function is better understood as a series of DNA regulatory elements. What's going on here is that, in fact, there are four intragenic enhancers 
that activate the PVT1 gene promoter. Uh, but if the PVT1 gene promoter were not firing, those enhancers are still active and they would activate MYC instead. Okay, so PVT1 promoter is really like a boundary element that prevents these enhancers from spilling over. We came to that conclusion because we did a genome-wide CRISPR I gene silencing screen identified that PVT1 promoter was the number one link RNA locus in the entire genome that when silenced help cancer cells grow. We further show that in fact, uh, uh, that there are uh, frequent deletions, mutations that inactivate the promoter, and that specifically uh, this PVT1 captured the three-dimensional looping and prevented the enhancers from spilling over. And so this basically pioneered the concept of a uh, link RNA promoter as a DNA tumor suppressor DNA boundary element. Like you're thinking about link RNA genes really as a series of DNA uh, control switches. Now, this particular uh, uh, studies of, of this locus also led us to kind of the next topic, which is uh, potentially chromatin clues to a very unusual DNA structure. Now, I've shown you a number of cases of these kind of tracks, basically genomic location on the x-axis and nice peaks like this. But in this particular case, you see this very unusual pattern where we have this almost 100 kilobase wide uh, contiguous high accessibility, again, spanning our friend Nick and the PVT1 gene, the five prime end, okay? So what is really going on here? In fact, these are extra chromosomal DNA amplifications. It's not just because there are lots of copies, okay? So at the bottom, I'm showing you a metaphase spread where these are cells arrested in mitosis. These big structures in the middle, these are chromosomes, staying with Gappy. And these little dots are also DNA. They're, these are the extra chromosomal DNA. And so in the middle panel is a DNA in situ hybridization or fish experiment against the MYC gene. You can see that the ECDNA, extra chromosome DNA, contains the, the oncogene MYC, not on the chromosomes. The third picture here is a version of attacks that, that basically you can read out with fluorescence, which we call attack C. Okay, so, and you can see that this little dot is as bright as this entire chromosome, okay, which is quantified on the right. So this shows that on a per molecule basis, the ECDNA has that more uh, basically uh, open, accessible chromatin structure uh, leading to altered gene output. In fact, we've now learned that exochromosomal DNA represents a major challenge for cancer patients. This is a very prevalent kind of a problem present in half of human cancer types, up to a third of human cancer cases over time. Um, they are unfortunately associated with much worse survival for patients and outcome. And these are actually uh, double-stranded, circular, large pieces of DNA from a 100 kilobase to a megabase that uh, always can, uh, nearly always contain oncogenes and associated DNA regulatory elements. And I'll describe to you then the transcription of the energy uh, in a moment. These extra chromosomal DNAs, they don't have any centromeres, they don't have any telomeres, so they're randomly uh, basically uh, um, passage randomly uh, segregated into daughter cells. Uh, so they can lead to a very rapid change in copy number. It's really a moving target causing accelerated evolution. And importantly, these kinds of clonal ECDNAs are unique to cancer. They're not found in normal cells. Our studies together with my colleague, Paul Michel, uh, led to a realization that there's something very different that happens when ECDNAs are, are basically pop out and tether themselves from the rest of the genome. And that is that every molecule puts out basically about four times more messenger RNA than the sequence, than the same sequence on the chromosome. Okay. So previously, ECDNA was thought of as a copy number problem. And all we really revised this concept to say that this is actually an epigenetic problem. Once the sequence comes out into this circular form, it is much less compact. It transcribes much more. And therefore, uh, we have a situation where we have the same sequence, DNA sequence, two different chromatin phase, really a new kind of epigenetic phenomenon. And so a lot of our ongoing work to now is to understand how this has happened. I've shown you a, a number of pictures of these uh, basically metaphase spreads, uh, but one surprise uh, sort of turned up when we looked at cells uh, in interface. So this is an image, again, of DNA in situ hybridization. In the, red, uh, in the green color is in situ hybridization for MYC, okay? And in red uh, is uh, against a chromosomal locus adjacent to MYC. So if you have a, a chromosomal copy, you'll see basically paired 
green and red dots. So there you can see there are multiple copies. If it's ECDNA by itself, it should just be green. Now these cells have actually about 10 copies of ECDNAs per nucleus. You can see that all 10 copies congregate together in one single spot. And this is called extra chromosome DNA hub, ECDNA hub. Okay, this is a micron size uh, collection of multiple ECDNA molecules. You can see three cells in the field. They're all doing exactly the same thing. Notice that there's plenty of space, right? The chromosomes are nicely spread out, but the ECDNAs all want to get together. Okay, we're really intrigued by these kinds of images. So we went on and study what might be the, where, what made the oncogene RNAs, where are they coming from, right? Are they coming out of, the, of these hubs or are they coming from singleton molecules? So first of all, I just wanna show you that when we look across many cancer types, uh, we basically always see the ECDNA hubs, for example, in prostate cancer, colon cancer, um, GBM, glioblastoma, gastric cancer. And we often even uh, we can also see this even in, uh, directly in primary cancer samples. For example, in neuroblastoma, you can see this. You know, every um, multi, most cells in this field have these giant ECDNA hubs. Okay. And secondly, uh, we can actually um, um, combine uh, RNA fish with DNA fish. So we can look at the nascent RNA transcription and see that most of the nascent RNA, for example, in the mic locus, is coming from the ECDNA not from uh, singletons outside of the hub, okay? So we were able then on to go on and compute the per molecule probability of transcription for every DNA molecule. So you can see that the ECDNA has a very high probability of transcription, whereas a chromosomal locus, much less. On the right-hand side, we can further quantify how likely each ECDNA molecule is to, is, is to fire, is to transcribe. Based on its relationship, with other ECDNA molecules. So we discover that the more they're clustered together, that is the more neighbors are nearby, the more likely each ECDNA is likely to fire. So in other words, this is a kind of cooperative transcription. They care about other molecules. So in contrast to your chromosomes, we have two separate alleles, right? They each do their own thing. In this case, the ECDNA transcription is somehow cooperative, okay? Um, so a major question then is, okay, so these ECDNA hubs, there are all these molecules together, what is holding them together? And we discover that there's in fact a very important protein core that holds them together. And this uh, um, uh, or, um, spread, um, uh, and our realization came from the fact that I just told you that ECDNA is transcribed like crazy and that they must be somehow using a lot of the enhancer promoter contact and transcriptional mechanism. One of these proteins that's involved in this job is called BRD4. This is a protein that contains a bromodomain, which is a reader module for uh, basically histone H3 lysine 27 acetylation, which is an enhancer associated histomar. The additional domains, uh, the low complexity domains, they also form phase separation. And so this image on the right just shows that both the bromodomain and separately the IDR is capable of basically, basically uh, forming these condensates, both in vitro and also in vivo with very high concentrations. And they can basically, basically group molecules together without membranes. Okay, so in the uh, now in this image, I'm showing you that in fact, we believe that BRD4 is tethering these ECDNA hubs together. On the left is a lifestyle imaging strategy so we can actually visualize the ECDNA shown in green. In the middle, we have now knocked in an epitope, a, a halo tag into the endogenous BRD4 locus. So that's shown in purple. You can see that uh, there's actually a BRD4 throughout the nucleus, but hopefully you can see that every place where you have an enrichment of BRD4, you also see an enrichment of ECDNA, okay? So finally, it's the key experiment. So on the left here, now you're showing, uh, I'm showing you again, a 3D movie of these ECDNA hubs. So you see, again, these giant uh, dynamic uh, uh, sort of condensates of, a of ECDNA. On the right, if we treat with a molecule called JQ1 that blocks BRD4 function, within 20 minutes, all these ECDNAs fly apart. Okay, you can hopefully see lots and lots of individual molecules now separated. Okay. And this actually has a profound effect on ECDNA transcription. And so on the left, I showed you first that ECDNA has a very high rate of transcription of the oncogene per molecule. If we break up the hubs, 
now that transcriptional advantage goes away. There's also a selective impact on cells with extra chromosomal DNA shown in blue compared to isogenic cells that still have elevated mid copy number, but now on the chromosomal locus, so-called HSR cells shown in green. Okay, so much less of an effect here. And indeed, JQ1 allows selective killing of the cancer cells uh, with extra chromosomal DNA shown in blue. Okay. Now we're really curious about this phenomenon because we, now we have these proteins that hold these DNA together, but we wonder how do different DNA molecules know to join that hub? What is their membership card to basically say, I you know, let me into the club, okay? And so our old friend, PVT1 uh, sort of comes to the fore again because our prior work on promoter enhancer competition showed us that PVT1 was able to basically take transcription away from the MIC promoter because it was a very powerful binding site for BRD4 and K27 acetylation. And so um, a number of experiments, uh, including this one, really showed that PVT1 promoter was a DNA element that allows you to join the hub. And the key experiments that you just put PVT1 promoter onto a heterologous episode, a plasmid, okay, like a reporter gene, that is enough for this new plasmid to join the ECDNA hub and now transcribe like crazy. And this uh, now uh, effect is of course now blocked by JQ1 and uh, which will of course then disperses hubs, which is shown on the right that indeed, basically if we add a PVT1 promoter to this, to this reporter gene, selective activation in cells with ECDNA hubs, they're blocked by JQ1 and not so much, uh, much less so in cells that have, um, again, elevated copy numbers of, of, of the same locus, isogenic cells, but not on a chromosomal locus. Okay. Now, some of you uh, listening to me may have realized that I just described for you something very uh, unusual. And that is that normally gene activation between enhancers and regulatory and, pro and, and, and promoters as I showed you in my first intro slide, happens on the same chromosome, right? They have to be on the same DNA molecule for these long range contacts. But this experiment I just described for you implies an intermolecular gene activation. This reporter gene plasmid has no enhancers, it's getting activated by enhancers in the ECDNA hub. Is this really something that can happen? So in fact, indeed, we turn to an endogenous situation where we have the gastric cancer a cell line, which has two different flavors of ECDNAs, one uh, coming from MYC, the second coming from the FGFR2 gene, originally from two different chromosomes. And indeed, these imaging experiments show us that these ECDNA hubs, they intermix. And on the right-hand side, uh, molecular experiments with chromosome confirmation capture uh, shows, again, extensive intermolecular contacts between FGFR2 and MYC extrachromosomal DNA. Okay. So King Hung, a very talented student, then went on to perform a genetic screen where we use CRISPR interference, which is a way of using uh, dead Cas9 as a programmable DNA binding platform uh, connected to a crab domain to silence elements that we tile across basically uh, in ECDNAs and ask, do, does it, do these elements affect expression of the oncogene on the same uh, ECDNA or the oncogene on a different ECDNA? And indeed, we found a number of elements, for example, in the FGFR2 ECDNA that's required for FGFR2 activation, for example, the F its own uh, transcriptional star site, and also um, similarly for MYC. But really, to our delight, we found there are a number of elements that act in trans, that is, in an intermolecular fashion. A number of elements on FGFR2, actually, I believe five of them, that are needed to activate MYC and conversely, an element that's needed from MYC to activate FGFR2, okay? So what I've told you then is that we discover a kind of an emerging behavior of the extrachromosomal DNA, like these schools of fish and swimming together, uh, these ECDNAs will actually congregate some sort of self-organizing principle into this basically transcriptional hub. And uh, the important concept then here is that um, even though we might be tempted uh, to call these things chromosomes, this is really a different kind of concept. Okay, a chromosome, as we know, is now a very long piece of DNA with proteins on top like nucleosomes and histones. Uh, and, and that is kind of the modern understanding of a chromosome. In contrast, the ECDNA hub has an inverse kind of topology. There's a protein core, for example, BRD4, and then DNA molecules decorating on top of it. 
Okay, and the basis for this interaction is actually this Bremer domain interaction with a histone modification. And, and that is the basis of these hubs holding together. Uh, we believe that this concept of ECDNA hub, I think will be important for this field because we think that the ECDNA hub is really the unit of the oncogene function, not individual uh, DNA molecules. Because inside these ECDNA hubs, we actually have intramolecular gene activation. So enhancer promoter contact can occur across different molecules. This allows cooperative transcription. So basically more spatial proximity, more gene activation, and really also a combinatorial and very promiscuous, promiscuous sampling of the regulatory input, something that you can never achieve uh, when you're tethered to chromosomes. Conversely, we think that there are some really interesting consequences, and that is that this, this kind of a cooperative lifestyle might uh, drive uh, ECDNA evolution, oncogene diversification, but we also think that this is a therapeutic target. Because as I showed you, if you break up these ECDNA hubs, this transcription advantage stops, and these oncogenes are basically rendered uh, much less powerful. Normal cells have chromosomes, right? So these ECDNA-specific mechanisms are only unique to cancer cells. It's really a truly a unique uh, and, and differentiated target. Okay, so I want to spend kind of the, um, the remainder of time talking about some of our new efforts on trying to read and write extra-chromosomal DNA. And one of the, the important challenges is that once we realize these DNAs are so important in cancer, we really like to basically determine the primary sequence of extra-chromosomal DNAs, okay? And that actually may not be as easy as you might think because every time we sequence a sample, we're sequencing all the DNA in the cell, extra-chromosomal DNA and the chromosomes together. And this basically makes a gamish, and then, you, then it's hard to tease it apart. So recently, uh, King Hung, the very talented student, we developed a method for targeted profiling extra chromosome and DNAs, a method called CRISPR catch. Okay, so CRISPR catch was a method previously developed to purify bacterial DNA segments. We have now adapted it uh, to purify extra chromosome and DNA from human cancer samples and cells. This method starts in the beginning by embedding your, your cell or DNA sample in agaros, which prevents shearing. And then we uh, you go on to prepare the sample for a method called pulse gel electrophoresis, which is a classic method for separating very large pieces of DNA. Okay, so I've mentioned that pulse field gel was invented by uh, Gil Chu and Ron Davis at Stanford. Uh, and the key insight is that large circular pieces of DNA will not go through the gel, they're trapped uh, in the well. But if you cut that DNA just once, circle turns into a line, and now it will run according to its size into the gel. The chromosome may actually get cut, but the chromosome segments are so big, hundreds of megabases, that they're still stuck in the well, so they don't go anywhere. Conversely, if you want to purify the chromosome of DNA, you have to make two cuts outside of the amplicon, and then that will also release a segment that can now run into the gel and basically go on to purify and sequence. Okay, so that's the concept. Let me show you what this actually looks like. So on the left, uh, this is again a metaphase image and that kind of shows you the challenge. This is a, a, a glioblastoma sample near sphere and the red dots are basically ECDNAs that contain the EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor oncogene. You can see there are lots of copies, about 100 copies. And uh, the, the blue uh, sort of uh, blobs are chromosomes. Okay, so we want to just somehow pull out just the red dots, not the blue, the blue stuff. Okay, and, uh, and then conversely, the, even the same sequence is actually present on the chromosomes, right? So there are about seven copies, or maybe five copies here. And so again, we want to be able to pull them out one the, uh, selectively one over the other. Okay, so at the bottom, that is uh, how we design our CRISPR guides is using the Cas9 for a very simple cutting function. And based on where we cut, we think we can isolate either ECDNA or the chromosomal DNA. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you now a pulse field electrophoresis gel. And you can actually see that this, uh, this works beautifully. You can actually release the ECDNA just by itself here. And uh, we can actually, now this is about 1.3 megabase. And so the first time we can actually directly verify the ECDNA size uh, on the absolute scale. 
And of course, secondly, after we sequence, we, we now get a massive enrichment in ECDNA content, a 30-fold enrichment. Uh, rather than sequencing everything together, we just sequence the stuff we want. So this is like exome capture, but for ECDNAs. Okay, so now we can see the data. Uh, notice that basically the coverage now is basically like up to 500-fold, very enriched. We have ECDNA, uh, and these different cuts basically correspond exactly to the size uh, that we wanted. And, um, and compare the coverage, for example, for the whole genome sequencing, 15x, uh, ECDNA, 500x, okay? So just, uh, this has a number of implications for what we can learn. For example, uh, in this particular case of the glioblastoma, we were able to identify all the single nucleotide variants and also subclonal SNPs and, and basically assign them to the two parental chromosome. This is called phasing, okay? And then this has a very important um, uh, consequence because we learn that, in fact, in one allele is the origin of the ECDNA. We see the ECDNA is all from one haplotype, and then there is a deletion at the original position, including a junctional scar read that spans the original locus. Okay? The other allele is intact. Second point is that you might notice the little white box here that there is a deletion in the EGFR on the ECDNA. And this is actually an activating mutation, uh, makes a variant called EGFR V3 that makes the receptor active always independent of the presence of the ligand. This is a clear oncogenic driver, okay? 100% of the ECDNA molecules have this EGFR V3 point uh, mutation deletion. Interestingly, the chromosome version of EGFR is entirely wild type. Okay, so you can actually, in fact, now learn for the first time that this oncogene activation is purely an ECDNA problem. The chromosomal genome is actually pristine. Second interesting point is that uh, there are actually models about how ECDNA is generated. One model posits that ECDNA happens because basically there's an extra round of copying during S phase. And that model predicts that you would basically have the intact uh, locus in the chromosome plus an extra copy of ECDNA. A second model, uh, alternative model, posits that this is a deletional mechanism. You basically make two cuts, you cut out the ECDNA like this, and there's a deletion of the original locus and extra chromosomal DNA. So our data clearly supports the second deletional model. And then basically, I think makes an important point about the, and then we believe that subsequently, a, uh, a one copy of the ECDNA gain the EGFR V3 mutation, which then swept through the entire population through positive selection because it's an oncogene driver, okay? Okay, uh, if, uh, we're also really happy to, to find that we can actually learn more just beyond the mutational landscape, but also learn about the epigenetic uh, sort of mutational mechanism. And that is that we can take the purified ECDNA molecule, remember no amplification, and pass it directly to single molecule nanopore sequencing. And this allows us to basically measure both mutations and also DNA methylation status. And we discovered that in fact, there are unique DNA demethylation events only on the ECDNA compared to the chromosome. So for example, right over the EGFR promoter, you can see there's a selective demethylation uh, and every molecule, every row here is a different single molecule. So you can actually read out the patterns in this kind of ticker tape, okay? And so uh, this, we believe, is a second reason uh, for the selective gene activation on the extra chromosome and DNA because they are losing silencing DNA methylation marks. Um, and um, we are, uh, you may know that I'm uh, a physician scientist. I'm a dermatologist by training. So I'm always uh, sort of really motivated uh, to try to take the technology we developed in the lab and apply it to clinical material. Uh, and uh, this, is, and what I'm really delighted to share with you that this is, has come to pass. Uh, some of you may know that uh, targeted therapy for cancer has uh, has had remarkable advances in the last decade, especially in the field of melanoma. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of our targeted therapies, such as BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors, MAP kinase inhibitors, they are met with initial response, but fortunately, then um, therapeutic resistance. Uh, and the mechanisms are not always understood. And here is such a case where a patient was initially diagnosed with a cutaneous melanoma, uh, which then has a BRAF mutation, was treated with a BRAF inhibitor, and also subsequently a MEK inhibitor immunotherapy. But unfortunately, uh, on therapy developed a resistant lesion, a metastatic lesion. Uh, and 
genomic surveillance showed that only at this resistant lesion did a ECDNA basically pop out, okay? And we were able to apply our method CRISPR-Catch and characterize this ECDNA. And this turns out to be an 890 kilobase ECDNA spanning the NRAS oncogene, okay? So let me first show you the genomic locus. So basically this interval here, the ECDNA, uh, actually spans basically two topologically associated domains. These are regions I like to fold up, but the genome likes to fold up by themselves. The right-hand side of this topologically associated domain, which is this triangle, contains a number of enhancers that are now brought to the proximity of the end string of the left-hand side of, of this interval through circularization. We're pretty sure that NRAS is the oncogene because the NRAS gene has a point mutation. There's a G12R point mutation that locks the NRAS in the active GTB bound form, okay? 100% of the ECDNA contains this NRAS point mutation, again, showing us that this is very likely the driver event. And so this is a situation where you have a basic a parallel pathway driving the MEK signaling, MAP kinase signaling, bypassing our drug inhibition. So many laboratory experiments suggested that ECDNAs might contribute to drug resistance. I think this is one of the clearer cases in human patients that this is in fact uh, the case. Okay. Now I've shown you some uh, examples where we have, we have ECDNA um, discovery characters by CRISPR-Cat, we cut a single band. Uh, and we can also, we have also worked together with computational colleagues to develop a method to automatically take uh, these bands and intervals reconstruct them based on uh, the, the sort of uh, the edges connecting a graph, and then we can directly match the molecular size to reconstruct end-to-end -end ECDNA primary sequence. This is actually useful because sometimes the situation is way more complicated than you may imagine. <clears throat> on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a post-field gel of, again, of this gastric cancer sample that we thought had two flavors of ECDNA. MIC and FGFR2. But in fact, once you cut with a single uh, reagent, you realize that you release, let's say, three different bands, six different bands. There are obviously multiple different species here, okay? And this is like impossible to sort out without a, a method like this. So in the past, if you do whole genome sequencing for this sample, uh, you'll get something like, like this picture. So basically now we're looking at genomic tracks. Uh, these are basically the copy number and these edges are trying to connect together uh, the possible connections. And this, if you, if this looks like a mess to you, that's exactly the point, right? Because the computer is trying to stitch together all these things. And basically it doesn't know how many molecules are actually here. It's just trying to stitch them all together. So this picture probably is just like a fantasy, right? Some of these molecules don't even exist. But if this picture becomes much simplified when you can cut out individual bands and then reconstruct the sequences together as shown on the bottom. So each band has its own pattern, right? And we now know absolutely the right size and how they connect together. So let me show you what this means. So uh, that very complicated picture turns into something like this on the left. Now I'm showing you the genomic contents of ECDNAs. These are the pieces of the chromosomes that are contained including a piece from chromosome 8, chromosome 10, chromosome 11. <clears throat> These are the, the epigenomic profiles. Each row now is a different ECDNA species. We know exactly the copy number and kind of the interval that's included. But moreover, we actually have an end-to-end, 360 degree reconstruction of the extra chromosomal DNA, right? And so the outer ring is the actually the primary sequence. The inner ring is a validation using another method called optical mapping that shows that, that, that these reconstructions are correct. And so this kind of analysis is showing us that there's actually remarkable extra chromosome and DNA diversity. Uh, and, and so, which I can summarize here, is what we learned uh, is that uh, in these ECDNA amplicons, sometimes we see a full locus amplification. So basically just basically the, the oncogene and the regulatory elements that are copying. There are more copies. In other times, we see enhancer rearrangement, right? Recombination events that allows the oncogene to hijack DNA regulatory elements so they can basically crank up their expression. But actually, I think further to our surprise, we see evidence of ECDNA specialization. We see oncogenes coding sequence that are amplified, but without its regulatory elements. And conversely, we see extra chromosomal DNA that contain just enhancer, just regulatory elements, but no oncogene coding sequence, okay? So in of themselves, 
these would be expected to be, you would call these defective oncogenes, right? Because they can't transcribe, but they only make sense because of the evolutionary force driven by the ECDNA hub. They can come together, complement each other, and basically still give the cancer cell a selective advantage. And so I think that the, 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 the occurrence of these specialized ECDNAs, especially enhancer-only ECDNAs, really speaks to a new concept uh, in cancer genetics, right? Really a purely regulatory oncogene. And uh, I think uh, speaks to the presence of these intermolecular gene activation mechanism as a driving force uh, for cancer evolution. Okay. Finally, I wanna to talk to you about the rules of uh, East Indian evolution. And so uh, working together with my colleague, Paul Michel and, and Ben Werner and other colleagues, We've been really thinking about modeling ECDNA through computation and mathematical analysis. These are backed up by experiments that measure key properties of ECDNA uh, expression, segregation, that allow us to make predictive rules for how ECDNAs may propagate themselves to different cell lineages. And then this then further allows us to give, get per therapeutic insights about what would happen if we do different perturbations and what would be, have the biggest impact uh, where, we, where we to make uh, certain modifications. So I'd like to show you some of the initial fruits of this labor. Uh, and this comes back to the concept of ECDNA uh, random uh, segregation. So I, I showed you this image already about the chromosome. And this makes the point that chromosomes actually undergo a remarkable dynamic uh, re uh, rearrangement. So in interface, uh, chromosomes are very floppy, but in mitosis, the chromosome condensed 10,000 fold to make these raw life structures that you all remember from textbooks. <clears throat> ECDNA actually do something the opposite, okay? This is another reason to think about ECDNA hubs as a different unit. So in interphase, they exist in ECDNA hubs, but in mitosis, the ECDNA actually break up and actually tether onto mitotic chromosomes and go into daughter cells. And from these movies we, can, we made, we can see that like, okay, the top, this cell on the right actually have more ECDNA pixels then on the left, so there's an asymmetric segregation. The challenge we face is that how do you scale this up so you can look at lots and lots of cells all at the same time? Uh, so the key insight that Paul's group had is that you can actually stain uh, mitotic cells with this, this uh, protein of the midbody called Wara B. And midbody is basically a cytological structure that bridges two daughter cells as they're dividing. So now when you look at a field of cells, you can see that these two cells are the two daughter cells coming out of a single division, these two cells coming out of a division and so on and so forth, okay? So now we can easily count up the copy number on the top versus the bottom uh, and really quantify the asymmetric or random distribution. So uh, now I'm showing you exactly that, that, uh, that analysis. We're looking at across, again, multiple different kinds of cancer cells, multiple different ECDNAs, and we can basically find that ECDNA distribution to two daughter cells completely follow a random Poisson distribution, right? It exactly matches up the theory. <clears throat> Some of you may think that, well, maybe this is asymmetric segregation, uh, but the asymmetry is definitely random because if you imagine isolating prospectively one cell that's gotten a lot of ECDNA copy numbers, if they were programmed, then the next cell division, you would also have another cell that enriches furthermore. But if they're random, you'll basically regress back to the mean. And the experiment showed that we see regression back to the mean, meaning that it's truly a random uh, sort of segregation. Okay. And so our model, um, after a, a number of analysis, showed that these just two features of ECDNA can remarkably capture uh, their copy number and uh, dynamic um, sort of presence in patient samples. And these two features are the random identity by descent, which I just showed you, the random segregation, and presence of positive selection, that is daughter cells with more copies would actually grow better or survive better. So on the bottom, in the middle here, I'm showing you a graph looking at the, the range of ECDNA copy number versus the frequency of cells with those kind of copy numbers. You can see this very wide dynamic range. The red dots are what actually happens in the patient tumor sample. Uh, the black dotted lines uh, is what what we uh, uh, what comes out of a uh, simulation. We start with the one cell with ECDNA, simulate to lots of cells with lots and lots of runs, but just by following these very two simple principles, we can actually, in fact, basically almost capture uh, the dynamic range uh, we see in patients. I use the word selection 
And so we should really prove that. And so Jack Rose in the lab developed a way to write uh, extra chromosomal DNA. And this is a method called CRISPR-C, a circularization. Uh, and basically what we do is we basically make two simultaneous cuts mimicking the easy-DNA biogenesis at some low frequency uh, that the, the two ends uh, will circularize, creating an easy-DNA junction. We can also separately uh, follow the heat, the, the scar that's formed. Uh, and uh, this creates a scar junction. And we chose to do this in the haploid cell uh, type so that we only have one copy of the chromosomes to deal with, and we can and basically analyze very sort of accurate digital droplet PCR, okay? Now we did this, Jack did this with the dihydrofolate reductase gene, which you can select with methotrexate. And so indeed we see that after ECDNA generation, in the absence of selection, we basically have uh, decay and then neutral drift. But if you impose positive selection with methotrexate, you can basically drive up the ECDNA copy number. And that and the, and the range that, that we see basically correlate, uh, comports very well with our model. And that shows that the kind of copy number we see that the ECDNA is much give like a 30% or 20 or 30% advantage every cell generation, right? To have achieved this kind of a positive selection. Okay. So in summary, what I've told you then uh, is that uh, uh, chromatin accessibility is a powerful annotated non-coding genome in diseases, especially cancer. Secondly, that hyper-accessible ECDNA will converge in uh, ECDNA hubs to immediate massive oncogene expression. And this occurs through the new mechanism of intermolecular gene activation. Thirdly, that the mutational records show that ECDNAs are driving oncogene activation, therapeutic resistance, and transcriptional rewiring. And <clears throat> that I think these new methods of reading and writing extra chromosomal DNA uh, would help us discover therapies that target these important elements in cancer. I want to acknowledge the folks who are involved in this work, uh, starting with Ryan Courses, uh, who led the work on TCGA, now a faculty member at UCSF. Uh, King Hung and Katie Yost led the work uh, on um, on ECDNA hubs. King also led the work on uh, CRISPR-Catch, whereas Jack contributed to this ECDNA evolution story with CRISPR-C. Uh, I gratefully acknowledge my collaborators, especially Paul Michelle for all the work together on extra chromosomal DNA. Uh, and uh, I gratefully acknowledge my funding sources. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, and uh, glad to have a chance to exchange ideas with everybody. Thanks so much for speaking today, Dr. Chang. See you later. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.